Hello and welcome to the final episode of this series of This Racing Life. We've been all over the country and heard a number of stories from behind the scenes in the racing world. This week, it's all about Epsom as the derby looms large. Here's what's coming up in this week's show. Rosebury set himself three lifetime goals and he set the bar high to marry an heiress, to become prime minister and to own a derby winner. There's so many great jockeys over, over time have never won this race. Well, that's the, that's the, I'm you looking at you me, there. Say <laughs> there were two men. You've got Steady Eddie Hurricane Lane, Mr. Reliable. He's always going to be there for you. He's going to be doing his best work. Mahafef, he's the street fighter. He's going to get in there. He's going to have a battle this one. I'm going to beat you. I think the Coronation Cup is uh, quite an iconic race, steeped in history. Lots of very good horses have won it in the past. It obviously comes on Derby weekend, and you know it's uh, you know it's watched by people uh, globally. First up in this week's Kazoo Derby Special, Dave Yates educates us on a stable that has historic ties to the famous race. I've come to the Durden Stables just outside Epsom. In 1617, Lady Elizabeth Barclay bought a messwidge with a dovecote, two gardens, two orchards and 12 acres of land with meadow, pasture and wood. And so began the modern history of the Durdens, which in the 19th and early 20th century formed an umbilical bond with the world's greatest flat race, run 200 yards over Chalk Lane at Epsom Racecourse since 1780. Charles II, two years after returning from exile to claim the throne upon the restoration of the monarchy, visited the Durdens on September 1st, 1662, to thank its owner, Lady Elizabeth's son, Lord George Barclay, for his support during the English Civil War. The site passed through various hands during the next 200 years, but its racing history starts with Amato, who triumphed in 1838 to become the first derby winner, foaled and trained in Epsom. Amato was bred and owned by Sir Gilbert Heathcote, who bought the Durdens in 1819 as a country retreat and place for his stables. The Heathcote family sold the Durdens to the 5th Earl of Rosebery in 1874, where he established a stud to feed his passion for racing. Primrose, who received the title Lord Dalmeny upon his father's death, he became Lord Rosebery after his grandfather, the fourth Earl, died in 1866, was educated at Eton before matriculating at Christchurch College, Oxford, in 1866. Having decided to leave Oxford, Rosebery set himself three lifetime goals, and he set the bar high to marry an heiress, to become prime minister, and to own a derby winner. He achieved the first of those goals in 1878, when at the age of 30, he married Hannah de Rothschild, the daughter and sole heir of banker Maya de Rothschild, whose death four years earlier had left Hannah the richest woman in Britain. Hannah's fortune, combined with Rosebery's family wealth, allowed him to develop the project. And in 1881, seven years after his purchase, he commissioned arts and crafts architect George Devey to join his team. Stevie designed this wonderful indoor riding school. It's one of three grade two listed buildings at the Durden still in use, and it was built so that mares and foals from the stud could be paraded before Lord Rosebery in comfort. The exterior is like a chapel with stone window frames and leaded light windows and Dutch gables on the east and west walls. Across from the indoor school, also built in 1881 and also Grade 2 listed today, are these 12 loose boxes. The set was complete in 1900 with the construction of Cicero Stables. 11 boxes and cottage accommodation for humans. Cicero Stables take their name from the 1905 Derby winner, bred by Lord Rosebery on this very site. More from Dave at the Durden Stables later, now we head to the race course itself, where George Baker is joined by Derby and Oaks winning jockey Martin Dwyer as they embark on a walk of the iconic course. Probably one of the most important bits, believe it or not, is actually getting to the start in one piece because it's a massive test of a, of a thoroughbred racehorse to even, well you know, just to get here with uh, enough petrol in the tank and with your horse nice and relaxed because there's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah, I always think when you're leaving the paddock you have to have a plan of action, don't you? You know, if you know your horse, 
we want to get them as economically to the top of the hill as possible, chilled out, and then you have a little walk at the top of the hill. And as you sort of come back downhill, you, it, horses can get very wound up, can't they? Yeah, we're, we're, we're covering a mile and a half to get here. It's a long way and you need to leave some petrol in the tank. Um, and things can go wrong, especially on Derby and Oaks Day with the hustle and bustle and the crowd here. I mean, if I remember, um, remember the American filly, little, uh, Daddy's Little Darling, she came over with great expectations and unfortunately she boiled over, she completely lost it. And I think the last bit she bolted, poor Olivia Pelle had a, had a real hard time, didn't he? I think his saddle slipped and he ended up bailing out and that was her, she never ran. And so things can go wrong before you even get to the to the stalls, unfortunately. But once you get down here and you're, and you're circling round and before the big races, it gets very quiet and eerie down here. We're away from the crowd a bit and everybody starts to get a little bit on edge. And I don't care what anyone says, any jockey that has ridden in any big races all around the world, when it comes to the Derby or the Oaks, when you're here just before the moment of loading into the stalls, it's a very nervous time because you're trying to keep your horse relaxed, you're trying to keep your game plan. And one thing that's always stuck in my mind, the, one of my favourite derbies, the first one I ever watched as a kid, was Slip Anchor's derby. I think it was in 85. I remember Walter Swinburne, he was just being loaded up into the stalls and Shadid, I think he was second favourite, and he actually blessed himself before he went into the stalls. And that always stuck in my mind. And I think that encapsulates what it means as a jockey to ride in the biggest race in the world. Riding in these big races here, would you be aware of where, where your danger would be going up, up to this point or not? Do you know would what? Would you just be trusting your own rhythm? Yeah, do you know what? Sometimes, if I look at last year's derby, I was trying to concentrate on following the right horse. Yeah. And I made much of an emphasis on that, trying to follow Ryan. And then I ended up getting skittled out of it. I got knocked down and went backwards. And then in other races, I've just actually completely ignored who's on what horse and just rode rode the race and just kind of made, reacted to what was happening. I think that's the best way. Yeah. Last year's race was just so messy. It was an absolute nightmare. But uh, I, I, think... just, I just find, I don't know, you just better just ride it as it happens. It was about that point there when I knew my race was gone last <laughs> yeah. year. Did you, were you aware of that in that race last year that the pace wasn't that strong then? Or, or was it just because of you were emphasis, trying to get him to relax and into a smooth rhythm? I know. Yeah, well, do you know what? It was, it was so messy and my horse was getting lit up every time something gave him a bump. And he can run keen, that horse. And he just kept getting lit up. And it's a horrible feeling, isn't it? You know when you're in the middle of the pack and you're, you're keen and you're trying to take him back, it's easier to find a position when you're going forward into it. When you're trying to get a horse to drop the bridle and then everyone's kicking past you and sort of nicking your position and it can be very frustrating when things don't go smoothly in hindsight's a wonderful thing in these situations isn't it <laughs> but even for a, for a horse and the connections a three-year-old can only run in in one derby there'll never be another derby for for my horse and and the same as a jockey i mean you know you know you've ridden in the oaks you've ridden in these races it, it's so hard and you need everything to come together and you know what i think that's why so many there's so many great jockeys over, over time have never won this race. Well, me, that's, you, that's you, I'm you looking at you there. You mean to me that? <laughs> you need everything to go right and you need, you need the right horse. But um, this track is very unforgiving. I would always be thinking I want to have them on the correct lead to get around this bend in a smooth fashion. In an ideal world, yeah, you want to be on your left lead so the horse is leaning left because the, cause the track sort of bends round to the left and it cambers downhill and you're going to hit Tattenham Corner, which we all know, the infamous Tattenham Corner, which we'll, we'll come to in a minute. But you want to be prepared for that. And, and like you say, you want to be on the right lead and, and you want to have your horse balanced. As our intrepid duo make their way around Tattenham Corner, Dave picks up on the story of Lord Rosebery. Rosebery described his wife as very unspoilt, very clever, very warm-hearted and very shy. But Hannah encouraged her husband's career ambitions as a Liberal politician. She would not see them realised, however. She died at the age of 39 in November 1890. The victim of typhoid fever complicated by Bright's disease. I've lost the best wife man ever had, lamented Rosebery, who never remarried. 
Having served as Foreign Secretary for six months during Gladstone's third term as Prime Minister in 1886, Rosebery returned to the role for his allies' fourth period in office in August 1892. When the 84-year-old Gladstone retired in March 1894, Rosebery succeeded him as Prime Minister. The second of his ambitions had come to fruition. Rosebery's ascent to the summit had been achieved with flair and panache, but his occupancy of the highest office was anything but a success. Presiding over a fractured cabinet, he suffered from depression and insomnia. He tendered his resignation to Queen Victoria on the 22nd of June 1895. The following month, the Liberals suffered a crushing general election defeat. Although 1894 and 1895 represented a disaster in politics, they were a triumph on the turf for Rosebery. Three months after becoming Prime Minister, Rosebery completed his lifetime wish list when Lardas captured the 1894 derby. Twelve months later, Sir Visto followed suit, and ten years on, Cicero gave Rosebery his third triumph in the classic. More of this trio later. Having retired from frontline politics, Rosebery continued to enjoy success chasing flat racing's top prizes. Plaque's victory in the 1924 1000 Guineas was the last of his 11 classics. In his later years, Rosebery lived as a recluse, and in November 1917, he suffered personal tragedy. These iron gates are at the centre of a poignant chapter in the Durden's history and have personal significance to Lord Rosebery. The gates were locked by Rosebery after he'd waved his youngest child, Neil Primrose, he and Hannah had two sons and two daughters, off to fight in the First World War. But Neil did not return. Serving with the Royal Bucks Hussars and awarded the Military Cross in the King's Birthday Honours of June 1916, he died at the end of the following year, having sustained fatal injuries in action during the Sinai and Palestine campaign. Save for restoration in 2013, the gates have remained locked ever since. Rosebery died in 1929, aged 82, at home at the Durdens. He was buried at Dalmeny. His was a life of privilege and on the surface, one of glamour. But underneath, it was a razor wire mesh of contradiction, darkened by insecurity and withdrawal. Despite the heiress, the political triumph and the Derby glory, Rosebery's life was one in which fulfilment remained elusive until the very end. Now we rejoin George and Martin three and a half furlongs from home as they analyse just what it takes to win an Epsom Classic. This is a part of the course where it all starts to happen and, and the race can really progress here and move on and you kind of have to go with it without fully committing. And, and fully going for it. Cause it's still three and a half fell into the winning post, but this is where things really start to change and, and, and happen here. And this is where you've got to assess um, where you are and, and how, much, how much you've got underneath you and, and, and what decision you're going to make next. And obviously, as you can see, the canvas falls um, progressively, but as you get past the two furlong, it drops right down towards the inside as you hit, sort of hit the rising ground at the furlong pole. Would you be aware of trying to keep horse in a smooth rhythm at this point. I always find the worst thing to try and do is fight the camber. If you try and drag a horse up the hill when it's not handling it, it's, it's the worst thing you can do. So you, you've got to go with it. You see so many jockeys will travel into a position here and then they'll try and peel out to the middle of the track to make sure they get a clear run, which I don't, I don't think that works on a, on a track like this. If I look back, I think one of the best derby rides, in my opinion, was Kieran Fallon on Chris Kin because he came around Tatton Corner, he, he was locked up on the rail in about sixth position and he didn't panic whatsoever and he sat and he stayed there and the race started to unfold around him on his outside and he kept just nudging forward, keeping tabs with the horse in front of him but he never left the rail until he properly straightened up and he felt he was able then to come off the rail and go and challenge but that, that actually helped me. Um, when I won the Derby because that flashed through my mind is, you know, not panic and if you try and drag a horse up the camber and challenge on the outside, you just exert too much energy and it can cost you. But for me, that ride on Criskin was, was, was an outstanding ride and the way to ride Epsom. So when you rode um, Rising Cross in the Oaks, I mean, you, fin you finished a good second, but she was tiny, wasn't she? Because I, I, I rode her myself. Yeah, because you, you rode her, you dropped me off her, do you remember? <laughs> I rode her in the Irish Oaks. But didn't she lose her balance? Didn't she stumble at the furlong pole? Yeah, she, um, 
as you as you're aware, she's very small, and um, I don't know whether she got unbalanced or I got her unbalanced, one of the two. And um, as Alexandrova came by her um, down her outside, she lost her footing, and um, it was a bit of a hairy moment. But there was nine nine thousand reasons I stayed on anyway. Did you um, do you think that did that cost you the race or not? No, definitely not. Um, Alexandrova was a very impressive winner. I think she won five lengths and. Um, Thankfully, she 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 got a you know she was very small and well balanced, got organised again and um, galloped home well. Here we are, Martin, just approaching the winning line. And can you talk us through some personal experience because you weren't aware you'd won, were you? No, it was a uh, it was a surreal moment really. I passed you know you know yourself your gut instinct. I thought I'd just got up, but there was a line of us and I wasn't quite sure. And then it was only pulling up afterwards. Uh, I thought I'd won, but I wasn't gonna. You know, I wanted to be uh, sure. And I remember Frankie saying, "Congratulations to Daryl Holland." So I was gutted, and I seen the smile on Daryl's face. And then, obviously, he was gutted when he he found out the result. But uh, no, it was a euphoric moment for me, that's for sure. Did you hear that over the tunnel when you were pulling up that you'd won, or was it quite a long? Were you back towards the winners' enclosure? Where did you hear the result? It wasn't till I cantered back around the corner, and uh, John, who looked after my horse, he was on his knees. <laughs> with his hands in the air and I thought he's either very happy to be second or we've actually won. And uh, I glanced up at the big screen and, and seen uh, our picture on it and I knew we'd won and it was, uh, it was, I mean, it was some feeling I can't even put it into words. And now we return to Dave Yates who chronicles more of the amazing history of the Durden Stables. Four Derby winners, Amato, Lardus, Savisto and Cicero have their final resting place here in the grounds of the Durdens. Amato was owned and bred by Sir Gilbert Heathcote, the baronet and member of parliament who had purchased the Durdens in 1819. And the cult has the distinction of winning the derby on his first and only career start. Conditioned locally by Heathcote's private trainer Rafe Sherwood, 30 to 1 outsider Amato was sent for home by jockey Jem Chapel on the descent to the straight. Iron went in pursuit, but reported the London Evening Standard it was with no result other than to get second place, the judge awarding the prize to the Epsom nag by a length. Despite his odds and lack of previous form, Amato was well supported by the locals and he's remembered by a local watering hole where by tradition gypsies chalk the winner's name on a well outside the pub as Derby Day dawns. Lardus brought with him an element of payback when he won the Derby for Lord Rosebery in 1894. As an undergraduate at Christ Church College, Oxford in the late 1860s, Rosebery had purchased a colt of the same name, but university rules decreed that students couldn't own racehorses and Rosebery was forced with a choice, academia or the turf. He chose the latter, only to see Lardus, the horse who took his name from the great runner of ancient Greece, finish last in the derby of 1869. Prepared for Epsom in Exning, just outside Newmarket by the veteran trainer Matt Dawson, the 2,000 guineas winner started at 9-2 to two on against six rivals, and he won by a comfortable length and a half to become the shortest priced winner in derby history. Noting that the triumph had given Rosebery temporary relief from a semi-harmonious cabinet, the Times went on, We congratulate the Prime Minister heartily upon his success, which is all the more welcome because it comes after a good many ventures in the same line, which have been unsuccessful. Lord Rosebery had waited a quarter of a century for his first derby and then two came along at once, courtesy of Savisto in 1895. In the first ever derby to be filmed, 9-1 to one chance Savisto flew down the outside under jockey Sam Lote, beating Curzon by three quarters of a length. To win the derby is to inscribe the name of the fortunate owner on an imperishable scroll of fame, declared the London Evening Standard. To win it twice in succession is more than a Double triumph! Rosebury silks, primrose after the family name, with rose hoops and a rose cap, remain the only colours of a serving Prime Minister to enter the hallowed Derby winner's circle. By 1905, Lord Rosebery had retired from frontline politics, but he remained a force on the turf, and he welcomed the last of his three Derby victories, he won 11 classics in all, with Cicero. 
The colt, whose name represented another nod to the classical world on the part of his owner, was the second of three Derby victories in four years for the American jockey Danny Mayer, one of a squad of riders from across the Atlantic who took British racing by storm either side of the turn of the century. Rosebery paid Mayer, then 23, a £4,000 a year retainer, and with 2,000 guineas winner Vedas ruled out of Epsom by injury, Cicero went off a hot favourite at 11 to 4 on. But it wasn't as plain sailing as the winner's odds might suggest. Cicero had to overcome trouble in running. Mayer had to switch after finding his path blocked against the far rail to defend his unbeaten record from French challenger Jardy. Cicero's three-quarter length margin from the Frenchman added his name to those of Amato, Lardus and Savisto to ensure the name of the Durdens would remain forever woven into the storied tapestry of the world's greatest flat rates, the Derby. Four wonderful horses there steeped in Epsom history from the Durden stables. A man with plenty of Epsom history of his own is Roger Varian, with two Coronation Cup winners to his name. As well as reflecting on those, we caught up with him about his big Epsom Derby hope, Third Realm. I think the Coronation Cup is uh, quite an iconic race, steeped in history. Lots of very good horses have won it in the past. It obviously comes on Derby weekend, and you know it's uh, you know it's watched by you know people uh, globally. So I think it's. Uh, I think it's a huge race to win and you know to have won it twice to particularly with postponed you know coming back from winning the Shima Classic in Dubai to win the Coronation Cup you know as uh, in the manner that he did it that was uh, that was great but uh, Defoe you know was uh, very special as well and um, I think uh, you know when you're, you're relatively young into your career winning those sorts of races on that sort of stage you know can only really pro propel your career. It's been a very happy hunting ground for you, hopefully even happier to come with Third Realm having such a good chance in the Derby this year. How do you rate his chance and were you pretty impressed with his performance last time out at Lingfield? I really was, I, I was very impressed with him. Um, you're never quite sure what to expect when you jump out of novice company straight into Patton company. And uh, it probably took me a little bit by surprise how well he coped. And um, you know, I thought he hit the front uh, plenty early enough that day and uh, maybe he was having a look around in front. I thought he was, val you know, value, uh, value for the win and, uh, you know, you'd, you'd call him a good winner, really. You have no doubts about him staying the trip. Uh, extra half furlong, that was in soft ground, wasn't it? Would that ground worry you slightly that you did it in soft ground, but if it was a firmer fir surface at Epsom, would that be a problem for you, do you think? I don't think he's ground dependent. I think it was very firm at Nottingham when he won his novice. It's uh, comforting to know he handled the soft very well, but going into Lingfield with a ground as soft as it was, we were unsure how he'd cope with it that day. So I suppose we are relaxed with uh, regard to what ground we run on. I wouldn't mind it coming up soft because I know he handles it. And of course, you know, not every horse handles soft ground, but I think if it came up good ground or quicker, I should think he'd be fine as well. Absolutely, he's a very exciting prospect indeed. As a three-year-old, he's certainly shown a huge amount of improvement, winning at Nottingham, then winning last time out. Do you think he's the type of horse that will continue to show that rapid trajectory upwards? I think he is. Um, he's a very tough horse and uh, very economical. Um, works nicely at home, but he, you'd certainly not describe him as a flashy worker. So he obviously saves his best uh, for the race course. Um, you know, he's only had uh, three career starts, so I'm, I'm quite sure his best days are ahead of him. And, um, you know, I don't feel we've got to the bottom of him at all in terms of the level of ability that, uh, that he has. Um, time will tell, of course, uh, how far he can go and how competitive he can be in a derby. But um, I really like the horse in terms of how he's done since Lingfield. He looks in a great place and um, you know, we're very much looking forward to it. Roger Vera in there with a live chance in this year's derby. Philippa Cooper has bred two live chances for this year's race, and we caught up with her in her home in Wimbledon, as she bids to add Normandy Stud to Epsom's Roll of Honor. Philippa, you've been the brains behind Normandy Stud for nearly 25 years, and now you've bred two horses who have got really good chances in the derby itself. You must have to pinch yourself a little bit. They went through Tattersall sales, and one was lot 300 and one was lot 306. So they were literally in the pre-parade ring together and both went through together. And 
it's just incredible when I look back to that day um, that they are now both in the Derby. That must be equally as exciting for you because you're obviously responsible for the dams and the grand dams too. Mahafef's grand dam, um, food broker Fancy, the reason we bought her was because I was at the race course one day and uh, David Ellsworth was also in the same box, the Dali box, and I just watched Food Broker Fancy come second in the Sun Chariot, beaten by the Goliath that was independence. And I thought, that is the kind of little filly that I want to breed from. And I said to David Ellsworth, is she for sale? And he said, she was sold yesterday. It's a very long story, which I won't bore you with, but I managed to buy her. She was badly injured, and I bought her in the spring of the following year. And she's the granddam of Mohafef. And to me, unfortunately, she's not with us anymore. And he's running for her in my heart because of that. He was so impressive at Newmarket last time out. He's a horse with a huge amount of potential and precocity. Do you see glimpses of her in him? I see glimpses of her, but much more so Food Broker's daughter and his mother, French Dressing. And French Dressing was unbeaten. She won her maiden at Ascot, and then she won the Lyric Stakes at York in 2015, and Rob Havlin was riding her. And William Haggis was there that night because he had a runner in the same race. And there were 35,000 people that night because Tom Jones was singing. So you can visualize the scene. And French dressing was always really, really well behaved. But she had a moment. She saw something in the corner of the parade ring. And she started rearing up, and she started to get very upset she wouldn't go down into the chute. And I was there with Nick, and I thought, well, shall I get my polos out? And Anna Lee, who's John Gosden's lovely traveling head lad, um, was with her. And they got her out onto the chute with Rab Havlin, and then she reared up, and time was suspended because Anna Lee lost her. And I thought, that's it. But she caught her. And I think the race was probably 15 minutes delayed because of her antics, and Rab actually trotted her all the way to the start. And even after all that, she managed to win by many lengths. And I retired her after that race. I spoke to John Gostin about it, and all that there was was the Prix de l'Opéra, and I wasn't sure if she was going to do that kind of thing again. And going under the underpass at Longchamp with all the tannoys going, I thought, no, I desperately want to breathe. That talent that she showed was just absolutely spellbinding. And that's how I started on the journey. So I would say Mohafif is more like her than Food Broker Fancy. Mohafif looks slightly more speedy, and Hurricane Lane's a real doer galloper. He just gets there on the line. Hurricane Lane... How has it been in his career so far from a breeding perspective? Have you always known he's going to be this good? Or has it been a gradual kind of raising trajectory up the ramp? Well, Hurricane Lane, I bought his mum, Gail Force. I didn't breed her. And I bought her out of training, uh, out of William Haggis's stable in 2015. And I bought her because she'd won a listed in France, bottomless ground over two miles. And I love my stayers. This is what I just love, cup horses. And Willie Mullins was underbidder on her to go jumping. So you can see she was, you know, by Scirocco, not very loved by the flat breeding fraternity. So with Hurricane Lane and Mahafev, you have to imagine, say there were two men. You've got steady Eddie Hurricane Lane, Mr. Reliable. He's always going to be there for you. He's going to be doing his best work. He's not a doer stayer. He will get there. And I think actually you'll see maybe with a mile and a half, the speed will come. The speed will come at the end. Mahafef, he's the street fighter. He's going to get in there. He's going to have a battle this one. I'm going to beat you. Then somebody else will come and take him on and I'm going to get you. And he's got that brilliance. I mean, in his listed race, okay, people can argue what did he beat. No disrespect to the other horses in the race. But he had that frankle at the end that it was like a morning exercise for him. It didn't matter. And uh, he's got that being able to stay on his side. And I think he's got that flash of brilliance. So you can guess who I'm siding with. <laughs>
Philippa Cooper there who's bred two live chances for this year's derby. And with that, it's the end of the derby themed episode and the end of this series of This Racing Life. We hope you've all enjoyed it and we'll see you all again very soon.